Okay, good morning everybody um, in the room and online. My name is Martin Wolf. I'm the branch head of the National Positioning Infrastructure Branch here at Geoscience Australia. And it's my pleasure to chair today's seminar. Uh, so I would like to uh, open this seminar by, with an acknowledgement to country and by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. Uh, and in Canberra, that's the Ngunnawal people, and to pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to extend that respect to any First Nation people participating in our seminar today. So today's seminar is titled Positioning Australia, Delivering a National Positioning Capability by my colleagues Ryan Ruddock and Amy Peterson. And it will be presented here uh, to a live uh, audience as well as broadcast through our webinar app. And we will make sure that when we um, have questions at the end of the seminar, those can both be submitted in the audience and through the app. The Positioning Australia program that you'll hear more about today has, is now delivering every day. Thousands of users from all around the country connect to our systems to access accurate and reliable data from a national network of continuously operating reference stations. And through this information, we have access to very reliable and precise positioning information. But the national capability such as this is not achieved alone through an um, agency like ours. It takes collaboration across all levels of government and industry to achieve this. And in this presentation today, Ryan and Amy will show how open data delivering through Positioning Australia is supporting uh, the, the broader positioning information in Australia and specific projects such as the Inland Rail projects and uh, specific applications such as agricultural applications in uh, South Australia. But to achieve these outcomes, there have been many challenges to overcome. And the presentation today, I think, will demonstrate some nice examples how we've worked through a time of COVID lockdowns and border closures to roll out a national network. And uh, we'll learn a little bit more on how we're continuously improving our offerings and access to our the positioning data in Australia. A little bit about the speakers today. Ryan is the director of GNSS Infrastructure and Informatics, and he leads the expansion, enhancement, and modernization of the national GNSS network here. He's been working on GNSS networks for over 15 years, and he sits on the governing board of the International GNSS Service, which aids the development and implementation of modern data standards to improve the access and distribution of GNSS data and products. And Amy is the team lead of GNSS infrastructure development and maintenance team in uh, the positioning branch. She leads the upgrade and the expansion of the 200 station GNSS reference network across Australia. And that uh, stretches from the strategy development, how you roll out such a network to the actual implementation. And because of her work, she engages and collaborates with stakeholders all across the country, uh, across all levels of government and industry and she has literally worked in the most, the biggest range of physical environments that you could imagine, some of them very remote. So we look forward to hearing a bit about that too. So with this, I would like to hand over to Ryan and Amy to talk about the positioning program. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Martine, for the introduction. Um, and thank you to those who've attended in person today and those who have um, connected online. So as Martine said, today my colleague Amy and I are going to talk about the National Positioning Infrastructure Capability, or MPIC as I'll refer to it from now on, and it's part of the broader Positioning Australia program. Unlike other presentations we've given on the project, today we're not going to focus so much on the technical details, but talk or share with you uh, some of the success stories from the last 12 months. And these stories are aligned to what we believe are core project or the core values of the project team. And that's collaboration, continuous improvement, and providing solutions to overcome challenges. So if you get anything from the, the stories today, what I'd like it to be is that MPIC is delivering and that we could not be doing so without strong partnerships between government and industry. Um, before I start talking about those achievements though, I want to introduce to those who are not familiar with positioning and the program, um, well, let's talk a little bit about that. 
end. Okay, so our position tells us where we are and helps us get to where we're going. An accurate and reliable position enables us to maneuver people, cars, tractors, and drones. Precise positioning underpins thousands of technologies which help us work, keep us safe, and improve our lifestyle. Today, we're fortunate that with the advent of global navigation satellite systems, such as GPS and mobile devices, we can now position ourselves instantly at the touch of a button. In fact, our daily interactions with positioning information are so common that we probably in some circumstances take it for granted. So to highlight this, I want you to think about how you traveled to work today or, or wherever you are. You know, did you use a mobile mapping application on your phone or in your car? Did you use a ride sharing service or a taxi? Or were you one of the few who went out there in the warm Canberra morning and tried to smash the GA car park hill plum Strava segment on your bike? Um, if you answered yes to any of these, then you've interacted with positioning information today and most likely through a GPS or GNSS enabled device. But devices like your mobile phone or your cycle computer are really only accurate to five or 10 meters. And while this is fit for purpose for many users out there, there are some who require significantly more accurate positions. So who are these users? Well, they're typically professional specialist users who have high quality equipment and use advanced positioning techniques. They're users who require positions accurate to just a couple of centimeters. And if you look at the photos here, they're the, the surveyors out there measuring our landscapes, the construction workers building our roads and the tractors plowing our fields. And soon they'll be the cars on our road and the drones delivering our packages. Now these users are able to obtain these hyper accurate or precise positions by augmenting or correcting the signals that come from the satellites with data streams from a network of ground-based infrastructure, or as we call them, continuously operating reference stations or cores. This is a cores. It's got an antenna for receiving the satellite signals and a receiver to decode those observations and some form of communication to stream the data to a centralized distribution hub. This course here is located on King Island in Tasmania. It's operated by Geoscience Australia. And aside from delivering real-time positioning information, it's also used to define and maintain Australia's ge geospatial reference system, which is a reference for positioning in Australia. And we refer to this as a tier two cause. But like most, most things, cores come in different sizes and shapes. And please don't get me to name where all these ones are, but um, in Australia, the number, there are a number of different cores networks operated by both government and industry. The data streams range from being free and open, like those provided by GA, to available for a fee from a service provider who adds value by providing guaranteed levels of service and system integration. And all of these um, industry service providers do make use of the data streams coming from GA. And as I'll talk about in a minute, some of them are now even working with us to help densify the MPIC network and support the sharing of data. So recognizing the importance of positioning infrastructure and the economic benefits that enhancing and supporting that infrastructure would bring, the Australian government in 2018 invested $230 million into improving access to positioning information for regional Australia and for Australian industries. This is what we now refer to as the Positioning Australia program. The program aims to enhance the accuracy and reliability of positioning in Australia, allowing for innovative technologies across industry that will accelerate economic growth. Or to put it more simply, we're building a system to deliver corrections via satellite, known as SouthPan or SBAS, that will enable 10 centimeter, ac 10 centimeter accurate positioning anywhere, anytime, and the infrastructure to deliver corrections over the internet that will enable centimeter accurate positioning in areas where mobile phone coverage exists, MPIC. And together these two projects form an integrated national positioning system. There's also a third project being worked on under the program, and that's an analysis center platform. This platform known as GANAN 
will allow us to use the data from the network to estimate precise coordinates and generate precise orbit clock and atmospheric correction streams. The platform will also provide feedback to us on the quality of the data coming out of the cause networks. So as I said at the beginning, one of the take home messages from this presentation is that MPIC is already delivering. What we're delivering is free and open data streams from 580 cores provided by 10 network operators containing observations from four global and two regional navigation satellite systems that enable 1,883 registered users, including eight service providers or system integrators who rebroadcast those streams as a service to tens of thousands of specialist users who are able to position themselves to an accuracy of better than five centimetres in near real time. It's a bit of a mouthful, but as I said, what we are doing is we're delivering today. But we're not done yet. By the end of June next year, we're still aiming to deliver a new delivery platform, continue to expand and modernize the cause network, continue to develop the analysis center software and begin, gather, uh, begin generating real-time products and enhance our data access services to improve the accessibility and interoperability of our data. And when complete, MPIC will contribute to a location enabled Australia. And this is a new infographic that people are being seeing for the first time now, and it's being put up in the operations centre at GA um, later this week. Um, but it shows the MPIC system. You've got the satellites delivering data to a cause network, that's streamed to an analysis processing centre, and then through our data access services, service providers and users are able to get access to that data and generate precise positions. So, MPIC, as I said, is something that GA cannot deliver alone. To build, operate and maintain the network, we've partnered with state and territory governments and industry network operators. To deliver the capability, we rely heavily on industry providers who take the data streams and deliver supported positioning services. So in designing the, the network, a key, a key criteria was to ensure that a sufficient density of stations to support the positioning needs of major infrastructure, oh, sorry, was to ensure that there was a sufficient density of stations to support the positioning needs of major infrastructure projects. And through our partnerships, I believe we're now doing this. So this map shows a 1700 kilometer line between Brisbane and Melbourne. It's inland rail route, one of Australia's largest infrastructure projects. It consists of 13 separate sections and stretches across three states. And when complete, it'll link Melbourne, and Brisbane with regional Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland, and link businesses, farmers and producers to, reach, uh, to national and global markets. The project will involve thousands of workers who will require some level of positioning. During construction, surveyors will need to accurately locate property boundaries and set out the route, and construction teams will drive machine controlled plant. And when complete, there'll be a need to monitor the trains and track the freight, all of which require positioning. So this map shows the openly accessible cores along the route in July 2018, when the Positioning Australia program commenced. It's primarily, primarily infrastructure operated by Geoscience Australia and the Queensland Department of Resources. So through the program, we've negotiated with cores operators along the entire route, and we've successfully established agreements to license and open up data streams from over 300 stations across Eastern Australia. And more recently, we've worked directly with the Australian Rail Track Corporation, AITC, and the Queensland Government to fill in the final gaps of coverage in the section between Toowoomba and Gundawindi. Um, and that's with the construction of two new GA owned and operated stations in Cecil Plain and Inglewood. By making this data from this infrastructure openly available, what we're doing is we're ensuring that all service providers have access to the, the data from this infrastructure which provides flexibility for the contractors working on the project. It also ensures that the infrastructure meets or exceeds national standard. And that includes, most importantly, an accurate and reliable coordinate that's traceable back to the national datum. Without that, you could end up in a situation where sections of track don't quite meet. So finally, this is what today the openly accessible along that route looks like. 
And we're not stopped there. We're still continuing negotiations with other cause operators across Australia, and we're hoping to extend a similar density of coverage up along the Queensland coast. Okay, major infrastructure projects, though, aren't the only ones benefiting from these government industry collaborations. Across the agricultural regions of South Australia, like many regions of, well, many areas of regional Australia, there are cause networks that have been providing positioning services to farmers for a number of years. But farmers in these regions rely on the infrastructure to enable practices such as controlled traffic farming. This provides greater productivity, sustainability and profitability for them. Unlike modern positioning services though, these users don't connect via the internet, but via UHF radio, direct from the tractor to the base station. So picture this, a farmer has connected their tractor to the local base station via UHF radio, they get an accurate position and they start harvesting. Partway through, the base station goes down, it's all right, there's another one nearby, they reconnect to that, get a position and continue going. The problem is that neither of these stations have positions that have been surveyed or aligned or linked to a national datum. And this introduces a shift in the position. And there's no guarantee now that that tractor is driving on the same track or line. So through MPIC, we've been working with the operators of some of these networks to, in exchange for making the data streams openly available, support them in maintaining and modernizing this infrastructure to meet national standards. And these upgrades include um, enabling the stations to track all the modern satellites and signals that ensures better performance for the farmers, have coordinates that are aligned and traceable to the national datum, ensuring interoperability between different base stations and transitioning from UHF to 4G connectivity. That improves resilience and enables the uptake of digital farming practices. So continuous improvement. Across the program and project, we're always looking at ways of doing things better and making our data and products easier to access. To date, a lot of the promotion around our program has been on um, the modernization and expansion of our cause network. While this is a key deliverable, there is another less talked about component that we're continuously improving and over the last few years, oh sorry, continuously improving over the last few years, and tomorrow marks a key milestone in the development of that component. So what I'm talking about is the software, software platform that is used to ingest the data streams and disseminate them to our users. It's what we call our Entrip Broadcaster and it sits within our data access services. So GA first started providing access to real-time data streams from our network in around 2006. To begin with, these streams were provided just to the international research community for the generation of near real-time satellite orbits. Over time, the users of these streams have, has grown and the focus shifted from mainly the research community to Australian businesses looking to provide accurate and reliable positioning services. So to account for this, we've been continuously improving this, the software platform and the biggest change probably came in 2017 when we moved the system into the cloud, which increased the performance and reliability. But in 2019, as we began ingesting some of the stations we licensed from these other network operators, the team came to me and said, we've got a bit of a problem, we've hit a limit. Um, we can't really bring in any more streams. It's not something we'd expected, um, but that gave us the opportunity and the need to improve further. So at this point, we decided to not just enhance the existing platform, but rethink it. After establishing our requirements, we looked at what was available in the market. And we made the decision that the most cost-effective solution was actually to write our own software platform. This had the added benefit that was it was able to integrate tightly with the analysis center software being developed as well through the program. So we moved forward about 18 months, and we now have a real-time platform that tomorrow will be released to a select set of users for a testing period. After this, 
we aim to start transitioning users to the new real-time platform in around August. Um, so far, we know that the new platform will improve user access, improve performance, and enable a substantial increase in the number of connections. It's also expandable and allows not just for the ingestion of GNSS data, but other scientific data streams. And that makes it reusable um, and could be used across other areas of GA. So while we've hit that milestone, Roy, as I said, we're still looking at ways to try and improve how our users interact with our data. One way we're doing that at the moment is that we've, um, we're looking at the standards and protocols being used. Um, we've partnered with Frontier SI, Positioning Insights and Curtin University to gather information on how users in Australia interact with positioning information and what metadata is important to them. And the outcome of this work will allow us to extend the current standards being used and ensure all users, existing or emerging, have better access to our data and products. And if you're interested to talk with us more about standards and protocols, please contact myself or Laurie Mansell, and we're more than happy to um, hear your thoughts. Now that's enough of me talking. I'm gonna pass over to my colleague, Amy now, who's gonna talk about how we're sort of overcoming some of the challenges in the program and Probably the biggest one was around 18 months ago when we had a global pandemic that we didn't really anticipate. So I'll let her tell you how we're responding to that. Thanks, Ryan. Okay, so Ryan has introduced uh, the National Positioning Infrastructure Capability as a collection of physical uh, um, infrastructure and systems. Highly visible to this are the Global Navigation Satellite System, uh, reference stations, or CORS, which are located across the country. Founded on a network of 130 existing stations, which are being unified under the Positioning Australia program, the final capability will rely on a 200 station network. That means a 50% densification. At the beginning of this program, the network was set to be both designed and delivered by GA, with teams grown to meet this challenge. At project initiation and as the program developed, several assumptions around how we might roll this out and, and modernise the network just didn't make sense. We humbly reassessed our value in performing the actual works, recognising that our value is in providing the governance and the vision for establishing the highly available network and not just in the building itself. I believe the strength of any organisation lies in its ability to self-evaluate, reflect, pivot and seek continuous improvement. We've been presented with two key challenges, actually correlated and that have required us to do just that. They've helped us mature our approach and methodologies to ensure successful delivery. The first, recognising the scope of the work and the required effort would far exceed our resourcing and capacity. The second, the national and in fact global positioning, the second is the fact that national and in fact global positioning knows no borders, whereas a global pandemic and our national response to it did. So even the most ambitious plans and highly tuned logistics and operational support would see us um, prioritising the implementation over the most valuable and indeed critical elements of the program, realising the consistency and providing the requisite governance to sustain long-term occupation and operation in support of a national capability. Consequently, to, um, to scale up and grow, we'd need to establish and nurture relationships strengthening collaborative partnerships, developing clear guidelines for use by contractual partners and extending our circle of influence. So in densifying the network, moving from this 130 stations, a tier two network, to a, a network of 200 stations, uh, we were required to obviously identify new sites to establish um, and host that infrastructure. So that in, in itself was our first challenge. Where do we put these stations and how do we do it? 
So as suggested in previous uh, talks, uh, there is a very clear path to land uh, acquisition and there is no roadmap for that. But what we do know is that it takes some time to realise uh, those new sites. Um, as such, we quickly identified that we'd need to distribute uh, or send out requests for help. Um, and they were, we've been ably supported by our state collaborative partners. So, for example, um, our partners in South Australia who have scoped in excess of 10 sites for us, uh, our state partners in Victoria, another four sites. Uh, we've also been scoping sites ourselves, um, particularly in MT lands, APY lands, uh, Dookie Yella, Warburton area. Um, what we've also realised is that there's capacity for others to help us here. So we, we don't have um, the, the capacity ourselves um, and what we're most interested in is the outcome. So GA embarking on our own scoping, again, the capacity um, is just not there. We have a very small team and whilst we realise the outcome, uh, so a new site that we can then progress approvals, uh, we, have, we, we didn't have the time or the resources to commit to that. So armed with uh, aspirational network design and very clear technical guidelines, um, also some guidelines around and principles around positive stakeholder engagement, we released an approach to market seeking assistance from industry to support us in this endeavour. Uh, understanding the complexities and the time uh, taken to establish the sites once they've been scoped, we realised that we needed a very definitive time period to deliver the scoping works. Uh, going out through the Indigenous procurement uh, policy, we sought the assistance of a private Indigenous company called Pulipang. Their expertise lies in um, archaeological and anthropological consulting, uh, very experienced in that area and obviously able to service our requirements. Uh, this in itself is not an untold story, so we have spoken about this, um, this approach previously. Uh, Pulipang have helped us scope 19 sites across WA, Northern Territory and Queensland. And for those that are familiar with those sites and our existing network, we are reaching into um, to remote locations that have not previously um, been uh, identified um, as part of this network, uh, very locked up and remote areas of Australia. As their work progressed, uh, we were looking pretty uh, much set for a completion by June 2020. So that would then allow us two years to pursue um, arrangements for those sites, engage, um, and obviously at the end, uh, seek some understanding and build the infrastructure on those sites. So the, the approach um, and the benefits from it were very clear to us. So very positive engagement on the ground uh, from the commencement with obviously the outcome being a report um, to indicate a, a suitable site on which we would take the recommendation and uh, work through the development and approval process. No surprise that industry can service a technical requirement just as well as we can. 2020 and our work under the contract came to a grinding halt as COVID drew a special gift. And we will call it that because despite transition to flexible work arrangements, uh, border restrictions, closure of remote Indigenous communities, um, you know, there are obviously other issues being prioritised in communities. It did require us to pivot and find alternative options from which we've drawn great uh, success. So what actually happened is Pulipang drafted uh, their own technical scope of works, which was very much in plain English, um, outcomes focused and would provide us the material to, um, to really identify and um, mature our desktop uh, assessment of the sites. There are a few concessions, so archaeological um, survey and some of the anthropology um, were not able to be uh, delivered but there were some other benefits. So the power of initiating that early engagement, having people engaged in the process, um, just essentially bringing community on board for that journey. Some of the, the benefits to the, to the program have arisen much sooner. So in our land access process, 
Um, a lot of the engagement happens once, once we present a proposal to the community um, and they consider that and take it to their respective boards. In this approach, we're actually seeking uh, the support of the communities in undertaking the technical assessment on the ground. So what that meant is they were excited. Um, they, were, they were very happy um, for us to um, uh, help build capacity within their local communities so they could undertake the work themselves and feel part of the journey and part of the story. In several cases, um, the requests have been tabled at local councils and PDC meetings with resolutions passed much earlier for support of our program. So I'm talking about support for the whole Positioning Australia program, um, support for ongoing and formalised leases and, um, and, and general support and interest. Um, from this, we've also gained some media exposure, opportunities to the benefits of a national positioning capability um, to the region. So communities um, in which we've used this approach um, with our ongoing assessment, so Rabbit Flat in WA, uh, Gibb River in Northern Territory, Kuna Warwick in WA, uh, among others. So it has been very much a success story. What we have found through letting go and having trust in others and reaching out and saying, actually, we need a little bit of help here, um, is that we're in fact providing great leadership, being inclusive, and expanding our circle of influence and bringing others along on the journey. This is a four-year project, but it's actually also a national plan of enablement that extends much broader than a four-year implementation. Okay, so similar to our experience in site scoping, the challenge of constructing uh, seems quite daunting. So um, construction can't happen on day one, although that is, um, obviously seen as progress, having some concrete in the ground. Um, there's, a, there's a big ramp up period. So the longer we spend in the design phase, the less time we have to actually build. So with the support of state partners and hosts, we believed that we would project manage individual site builds, um, working through a combination of doing some of the work ourselves using state partners, um, hosts, um, and industry in terms of a, a head contract um, model. Um, that thinking uh, was simply not going to get the job done, particularly um, as COVID hit. So 2020 started as the year of the build and um, we very much said that 2020 um, was going to be a successful year of rolling out uh, sites, so constructing new sites. Um, it was, it was to be designed around the construct of a, a head contractor, so one entity that would then subcontract uh, the works out across the nation. Whilst there are benefits to this approach, um, the aspiration of a consistent um, approach to modernising the network are obviously contingent on securing land access. As we've mentioned, this is a very lengthy process and is often outside of our influence or control. Having a head contractor reliant on packages opening up and having all of the scope of works dumped on them at the, at the commencement was, um, was something that would um, potentially compromise the, the delivery. So COVID-19 became the catalyst to establish a contracted services panel through which packages of grouped works are now being released and delivered in parallel across multiple head contractors. Right. Not only has this provided the ability to scale up and mitigate some of the localised national risks due to COVID, but it's also introduced significant competition and redundancy in the procurement, ensuring that we can deliver a quality value for money Genesis network by June next year. So at the moment we are delivering and this approach is serving us and we're continuing continually refining and learning. There are several benefits um, that we have derived and obviously working from a governance point of view, we're interested in the outcome. So the final, um, the final infrastructure providing the capability which supports us in our national positioning infrastructure.
Under the head contract, uh, sorry, under the panel model using multiple head contractors, we've actually divided the country now into the regions shown, which are very uh, um, localised. Contractors have self-nominated for which regions they can service, and we're rolling out packages aligned to these regions. So these very much fit within state borders um, that we had experienced uh, issues getting into some of the, these areas through COVID, um, but it also means that um, contractors are not expected to work across the nation. At present, we have um, several packages underway, so Northern Territory, Queensland, Victoria and South Australia, and packages are continuously being released as land access becomes available. On our roadmap to completion of our 200 station network by June 2022, we're now confident in our approach and that we're well on the way. So whilst progress towards program delivery is definitely gauged by green dots on the map, and in fact now I think they might be blue dots on our map in the operations centre, um, that's not so, mu so much the destination, but just part of the story and the journey towards the ongoing capability. So as Ryan's mentioned, we are delivering, we have capability available now, and it's not a big bang approach where we approach 22 and we say, right, now we're turning this thing on and we're ready to go. We are already delivering. So any challenges that we've met are only time dependent. A solutions focus, the ability to think outside the box and approach our modernisation with strong engagement and the ongoing support of a myriad of stakeholders. And when I talk about stakeholders for a 200 station network, we've probably got a thousand stakeholders. Um, for, each, for each site, there are potentially at least five that we're talking to and engaging with. And it's with their help and support that we, can, um, that we can benefit and push the Positioning Australia program. So we've certainly grown our collective team and developed our thinking and positioning in governance, uh, governance in positioning and flipped these challenges around. So collaboration, continuous improvement and challenges. This is our story. Thanks very much, uh, Amy and Ryan, for uh, in interesting, and I'm looking here, Robert is going to do some magic with the IT so that we can take questions from everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, giving us a great overview uh, on the national positioning infrastructure uh, capability component of the positioning program. And uh, I think if nothing else, uh, we've had a really uh, great and varied insight into the different types of partnerships that we uh, have used to deliver the outcomes that we are already delivering, as we've just heard. And I think that is maybe something that is not always immediately obvious if you hear about a capability like this. It's often defined in terms of a very single outcome. But just to know the, the diversity of approaches and the diversity of work and the diversity of engagement and partnership that make that possible is a really powerful insight into uh, the strength of a program such as this. And it also probably will uh, help you understand how we envisage this to be part of a really long journey, not something, as we say, that goes on with the Big Bang. We, we like Big Bangs, but the real value is around the way that it keeps on rolling forward. And the partnerships are really very much part of that. So with that, uh, opening up to questions in, in the audience, and unless I see hands shooting up now, I'm going to, oh, here we are, James. That was a great presentation. Thank you very much, both of you. I've got a question for Amy. I really enjoyed the story about the change of focus and the agility of trying to adapt to the change circumstances. And that final slide indicated a change from the original vision of 130 upgrades and set of three stations to another set of words. Is it still the same number of new stations going on? Can I confirm, uh, Robert, and uh, 
that nobody will be able to hear Amy's answer if she answers from the front seat. In that case, would you mind speakers coming up for your questions? Because <laughs> it will be real late for the network. So, Amy, can you repeat the question and answer? Yeah, can you repeat so James has asked whether the deliverable is still a 200 station network with 70 new stations, and that is correct. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to go for a question from the um, or from the audience. And um, okay, so the first question is: Given the legal requirement for survey measurements to be within five plus or minus five millimeters, are there also plans to create new survey benchmarks at existing and new sites. Ryan, is this one that you could shed some light on? Yeah, so I guess the way to answer that is um, when you trace this back to the, the reference frame, the 200 station network that we're building is the, the recognized uh, of those stations are used to define the national datum. Um, and the coordinates and the on all of the survey maps around the country are propagated from that the coordinates of that network. Um, yeah, that's... Right. Are there any other questions in the room? I'm Laurie. I'm just curious if you hypothesise for a moment if you hadn't done that pivot, where where would construction be now? Um, just talk us through the difference in the picture between the what you are delivering now, and how far back we would be going. I think some of the challenge, so if we'd gone a head contractor model, a single head contractor, in normal circumstances, this may be okay, but the challenge is in mobilising workforce and teams uh, across, um, across the country, and often head contractors do have um, depots or regions which they uh, can service their work from, um, and potentially we could we could still have delivered under that model, um, but also with land access. I guess people, when they're bidding for works, they want the clear scope of work up front and it becomes um, a very solid specification and thing that they're delivering. Whereas under the panel, uh, there's no promise of volume or value for, um, for people, uh, contractors sitting on that. So the release of packages allows us to... Um, I guess, move with the, the same pace as the land access. So rather than land access being a barrier to delivering on a whole contract, uh, it is really only a barrier to delivering on particular packages, which may get left to the end, if that makes sense. Um, but also with the, the several contractors, uh, you can roll out in parallel. So that gives you more capacity. Great, thank you very much. There's a question here. I'm going to paraphrase a few questions that are appearing uh, in the chat line. Uh, would you mind talking a little bit about what that actually means, the uh, 10 centimeter, three centimeter accuracy? And for example, what about the vertical um, error? Ryan? So I guess when we talk about MPIC, we're providing access to data to GNSS data that doesn't come with any sort of inherent accuracy to it. Um, it's how that data is used um, and what equipment is used that determines the accuracy. So when we talk about sort of three to five centimeter accuracy with MPIC, what we're talking about is users with the right equipment using the right techniques to be able to attain that sort of accuracy. Um, there's a, I noticed there's questions here around vertical and horizontal accuracy. Um, typically, we're talking about horizontal accuracies. Um, the vertical accuracy, when you're talking about GNSS, is slightly higher than the, um, slightly worse than the horizontal accuracy. Um, I hope that answers those questions. I think that goes a, a good way towards it. Um, unless there's anything in the room, uh, Dave? Yeah, excellent presentation and congratulations, Amy and Ryan and your teams for getting this program to this point. It was really nice to get that update from where you're up to. 
I also uh, liked a lot um, the piece around the collaboration you've had with the private sector and, and uh, particularly the licensing of uh, the extra stations coming in. And I'm curious to know what that uh, did to your uh, um, vision of what the rollout of the 200 stations and rollout and update of the 200 stations. Like, how did that evolve as you brought in the new private sector licensing? I guess um, the way the way I sort of describe the network at the moment is, to some extent, you could look at it as two networks. We've got this really high quality two hundred station network that has that's aimed to be designed with a station every two to three hundred kilometres. That network's of geodetic quality and forms the foundation of the reference frame in Australia. It also is multi-use, so it can provide real-time corrections. The Agreements we've come to with with um, other government agencies and industry to densify that further is around being able to deliver um, these high quality positioning services. So it's a densified network aimed at being sort of around 50 to 150 kilometer density across areas where there's mobile phone coverage, which will allow users wanting to do those sort of advanced position techniques access to the sufficient density of infrastructure to do that. Um, and I'll, I'll add there, we do rely on industry a lot to deliver some of that capability. So it's not all being delivered by GA, but um, the services are supported through industry. The other thing to note there is that, that um, the, the tier three contributions are very much time based so that they could be supporting a particular project for a particular point in time. So there is the option uh, obviously, to move, take on more streams, uh, release some, whereas the 200 station network is a very permanent uh, infrastructure that's got a long, a much uh, longer purpose, I guess. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to make this the final question until uh, unless um, people jump up and down that they want another question. Um, no, I'm sorry, this. I clearly should have worn my glasses for this one. Um, so uh, can you detail the updates and the status of the um, how this network facilitates the, uh, the geodetic datum? And uh, there's a, an element in this question about the transition, but I'll, I'll let you pick that up in the way it makes sense okay. to, to your particular presentation. So the way the question's talking about um, the migration from GDA 94 to 2020. Um, what I can say is all the, the streams coming from our, our network, the MPIC network now, are providing coordinates in GDA 2020 so that anyone using those streams will be able to do work on GDA 2020. Um, if they want to do work on GDA 94, we do provide the transformation parameters to switch between the two. Um, I think that sort of answers the question. And But your network itself the, also the, benefits the, the development. The network, yeah, of course, the network um, contributes to the the realisation of GDA 2020 yeah. and the maintenance of that data. And, of course, the um, Australian Terrestrial Reference Frame. Okay. If there are no further questions, then uh, I would like to ask to you to join me in thanking our speakers again for a cracking presentation. So thank you. And I'll also um, plug the next week's presentation when Earth observation scientist Do Dr. Robbie Bishop-Taylor will present on time and tide mapping Australia's dynamic coastal zone through time and space using digital Earth Australia. Uh, so until recently, the Australia's coastline, which is highly dynamic and diverse, uh, has been inconsistently mapped and next week's presentation will give you insight in how innovative DEA products are now providing new information to help maintain and understand Australia's shores. And this talk will be through webinar only, so if you're interested, please keep a lookout on the GA webpage and you'll find the link to this uh, to be able to access this presentation. Thank you very much.